Hello, and welcome to the Chengdu Gaming Federation podcast. My name is Charlie, and I'm joined by a guest who recently joined me on the podcast. His name is Ryan. Say hello. Hey, guys. I'm back. It's Ryan. Welcome back. After we recorded our previous podcast on game development in China, we kind of started already thinking about this podcast, and the subject of this podcast is free-to-play, the free-to-play business model, which I have predominantly been working in for years, and Ryan has as well. This has really been a transformative business model on the gaming industry. Right now in 2017, the gaming industry as a whole, I mean, including indie games and PC games and mobile games, really has transformed into a gargantuan industry, which is larger than the Hollywood film industry, maybe in largest part because of the free-to-play business model, which dominates or comprises the vast majority of mobile app revenue. So as a lot of listeners know, and certainly as Ryan knows, most of the revenue from places like the App Store or from Google Play are from games. Something like 80%, I believe, or, or perhaps even more of the revenue. If you look at the top grossing charts, it's, it's dominated by games. And of those games, they are almost all free-to-play games. I think one of the only exceptions that I ever see there is Minecraft which I believe still costs $7 in the App Store, which is a small miracle that can continue to sell at that rate. But for people who don't know what free-to-play is, maybe you can get this started by explaining what is free-to-play. Yeah, okay. Um, I remember when I first got an iPhone and you know I just spent all that money on it and I went on the App Store and I wanted to load up with apps and I tried out all the free ones because I didn't want to spend more money on apps. And I, I was really disappointed and because the game, they were like, every all the content was locked or you just, it was obvious that you had to pay money to enjoy the game. They weren't really free. Right. And then I just put that away and never opened a free to play app for years until I started working for the mobile game industry. And that's when I realized that, wow, free to play is actually the dominant paradigm in monetizing games nowadays. And I had no idea that this is how successful game companies make games. And if you look at the top top game companies, Supercell, for example, Clash of Clans was one of the first really su- successful mid-core free-to-play games that uh, brought free-to-play to... The mainstream, pretty much. The mainstream. To Super Bowl commercials. And now it's just every game, every tiny developer is trying to do free-to-play because it's the only way to compete. It, you know... It kind of is. Yeah. I mean, if you are an indie developer and you want to make a small scale project, you know, kind of like your Carrier Commander game, which we talked about at the end of the last podcast we recorded. Mm -hmm. I believe you plan to sell the game for a couple of dollars and a lot of indie developers in your position choose to do the same thing because if you don't have a ton of users, then it can be really hard or impossible to make any revenue at all. But when we're talking about big companies of a dozen people or more, even going into hundreds of thousands of people who are developing games, especially on the mobile platform, then at that level, I really think that it doesn't make sense to do anything other than free to play with very, very few exceptions. Yeah. So one of the dominant driving forces of free to play is this idea of user acquisition. And that uh, this is actually contrast to what most people think about themselves as customers is that Game companies are paying to get you to play their game. They're actually pay- they're paying to get their game in front of you in advertising, whether it's on your Facebook or in other games. And then they see you as a cost. There's a cost of customer acquisition. And the whole idea about free-to-play is if my average user spends $5 in my game and I have to pay $4.60 to get them, that's a profit. That's a profitable business model that I could scale to 1 million users and and make a million bucks. There are, yeah, there are so many ancillary concepts which surround the free-to-play model, which are so important. User acquisition is one of those. What I found in my company that I worked in for years is that it was about 300 people or so who were working in the company. And I would say of the people who were actually working in production was maybe like 60 or 70 people. And by production, I'm talking game designers, programmers, people who are actually making the games. The other several hundred people working on things like marketing or user acquisition or customer support or all these things which only exist in free-to-play games, essentially, because there are all these other concepts which are really important. 
And it's interesting to see how much games have changed. I mean, when I started playing games, I mean, really until the iPhone came, it was really the iPhone, which like changed all of this. It was the app store, which was in 2008. Before that though, the pretty much sole metric of success for a game was sales. And that was it. So you, you make a game, you develop it for a year or two years or whatever it is. And then the game launches and then you look at the sales. How well did it sell? It sold well or it didn't sell well. And now it's not like that at all. I mean, the launch is like a, a big part of a free to play game, but they tend to have a long tail and there are all these other things involved. So it gets much more complex. Yeah. I wanted to build on something you said about um, when you were working for your last game company, that the majority of of the employees were working in user acquisition and marketing. Yeah. And another way of looking at that is nowadays with a modern game company, if you are budgeting your new game, 80 to 90% of the budget will be in user acquisition and a very small portion of the budget will be in developing the game. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting fact. I think, what was the amount that uh, Game of War was spending every day on user acquisition? The thing was, people could see how much money they were spending on user acquisition, and they were really seriously questioning whether or not, you know, how much profit were they actually making because they're investing so much money into user acquisition and ads for that game are everywhere. And a lot of these free-to-play games are like that. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, Clash of Kings, which is another one, which is made by Elex here in China. That's a game which has achieved major worldwide success. There were subway ads for this game in like Moscow. I mean, like truly global um, advertising campaign. And aside from Clash of Clans, Game of War also had a Super Bowl commercial. I mean, they really like pull out all the stops to try to get users inside these games, which is kind of one of the biggest, you know, surprising facts that I think a lot of people don't understand about this. I mean, when they hear free to play, it's, it's kind of misleading, right? Because it makes you think that the game is free. Well, the game is not free. The, the developers are making an inordinate amount of money. What I found was interesting after several months of working in the free-to-play industry was just the math of how many people actually pay inside the game and how that becomes profitable for developers. Yeah, one thing that's funny is it's become so competitive now that companies are actually willing to take a loss, take a loss to get players. So if the uh, average lifetime value of a player is $3 and you're paying $3.20 to get them, some companies will spend millions of dollars acquiring large user bases for the hope that one day their game community will be so big that it will pull users in on its own. Right. Yeah. This is kind of like gaming the charts too, which is what people have been doing for many years. I think that it's been become a lot less effective recently in recent years. But previously, it used to be that this is one thing that I have had experience with actually is app of the day, free app of the day. Have you ever heard this website? No. Okay. So it's like freeappofthedaycom This was many years ago. I think that it was really popular. It's probably still around, but not as influential as it used to be. But what it would be would be they would, you would pay like $10,000 or something like this, and they would make your app the free app of the day. And this would result in a massive influx of new users. And you would pay for this, um, not necessarily because those users would be really valuable because they might not be, but because that number of downloads to your app would, would shoot it up the charts. And mm -hmm. getting it up in the charts creates visibility for the app. And a lot of people spend a lot of time browsing top grossing apps, uh, top apps in the strategy genre or in the games genre. And having that visible position is worth a huge amount when there are so many apps in the app store that really no one can possibly be on track of everything that's there. They just want to see what the most popular thing is. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of schemes like that. Uh, just paying for users through paying for ads. I know there's a company that... Um Blue Stacks? Yeah, Blue Stacks. Uh, and what they do is they sell uh, your game's placement in a virtualized Android console. So if people install Android on their PC, uh, I think your game just comes pre-installed and that helps you helps you get more users. So there's all these companies just so many to yeah, game you in the charts. There's so many schemes, so many crazy schemes. Also, incentivized app installs. This right. is a scheme which uh, Apple has actually like kind of come down on pretty hard over the last two years or so. Basically, a Tapjoy was like one of the big companies that was doing this. Basically, the way it works is they would uh, promote your app and bring users to download it. 
But in a lot of cases, they would do it where, let's say you're, we're playing a game. We're playing like Clash of Clans, for example. And it says uh, you can get more crystals if you install this app. And it might, it'll be the app from some developer who's like paid to get put in that position. And so from my perspective or our perspective, we're playing Clash of Clans. We just want the crystals. We don't care about this game at all, right? So we'll just download the game and then we'll delete it later. And then we'll get our crystals and we'll move on. And what that does is brings a huge number of downloads to the game, shoots it up the chart. Obviously, it doesn't give any valuable users because it's the number of players who are going to meaningfully invest in the game, time or money or otherwise, is going to be incredibly low, very, very small. But this is just one way of scheming, basically. And Apple has come down on this and said that that is no longer allowed. So, But there are it's a cat and mouse game. There's constantly different schemes going on. And the free to play industry in general is man, it's pretty pretty dirty. You know, there's so many underhanded tactics and it's really all just about getting eyeballs and attention. And I know that you have some pretty detailed notes which are based on some blog posts which you wrote, which go into further detail on a lot of these things. Tell me about your blog though, real quick. Yeah, sure. So um I I exited the uh, mobile game industry. After working in it for a few years, uh, you might say I had enough. And on my way out, I thought it would be a good idea to kind of write a guide or introduction to new people who come into the industry and want to learn what 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 are all the terms, um, what are the ideas, what are the predominant trends in designing games nowadays. And so um, I wrote a series of blog posts that are divided into user acquisition, retention, and monetization. And I was just going to go through some of the more interesting parts of that today on this podcast. Yeah. So the first being um, user acquisition, which we just talked about. Right. And the important thing to understand there is just that companies are paying for you to get in their game because you have to see it how they see it. Once you're in there, you are in their marketplace. You're walking around their mall and that's where they have opportunity to sell things to you, whether those are gems or crystals or a new shield you know, what I thought was interesting too, just really quick side note on this, is that in the games which I worked on, obviously the most valuable players are called whales. And these are mm-hmm. the players who spend a huge amount of money. And a whale would be, for example, someone who spends $1,000 or more. Mm-hmm. And that goes up to, you know, there are individual players in these free-to-play mobile games which spend a million dollars or more. So the ceiling is really high. But in addition to these whales, which you obviously want, you also need other players who will not spend money for the whales to beat up on. And mm. so there is still value to having players who don't spend any money just because they fill out the ecosystem, which allows whales and other people who spend money to thrive. Yeah, socially, they give your game proof by having other players in it. Yeah. Um, so one of the first things, one of the most important metrics in your game design is called day two retention. And what this means is after somebody installs your game, do they come back? Because... Um, uh, a really good day two retention for some of the top games on the market right now might be 60%. But most games are operating between 5%, maybe 20% is good, which means that 80% of the people who you paid to download your game actually abandon it. So what you might think of as a player is everything you experience in your first day in a free-to-play game has been meticulously designed to keep you interested in the long haul. Yeah, the FTE. You familiar with that acronym? No. First time experience. Oh, right. It's right. basically the inordinate amount of time which is spent carefully cultivating every single excruciating detail of the first 60 seconds that someone experiences the game. And it's said that, you know, people's attention span are so low that any single one mistake or problem inside that 60 seconds will blow it all and make everything else not matter. Yeah, and so you can you can extrapolate from this that the late game content that you might enjoy as a uh, Someone who's invested a lot of time and maybe even money into the game is going to have a lot less thought put into it because far fewer players are going to reach the late game. Right. Just get them climbing the ladder. You know, <laughs> once they get the rhythm of climbing up rung by rung, then you've already you've already hooked them. You've already got them. But the really challenging part is to just get them started on that treadmill. So speaking of climbing the ladder, um, the next thing I've written down is compulsion loops, which are a uh, key. Uh, element of game design where you get players g- to operate in a cycle of behavior. And once they go through this cycle a few times and it, it offers reward for, for certain actions, 
then psychologically they will they will just become addicted for lack of a better word they will want to continue this cycle you can see this happening in the fte for a lot of popular games so like for example when you play clash of clans it'll say tap here to open the building list and then tap here to build a barracks and then position the building in this way and oh you use crystals to speed it up and tap here to buy crystals these are free this time and if they're training you to take all the steps that you're supposed to repeat on your own yeah, so the classic um, compulsion loop is kill monster, win gold, buy stuff. And then what do you do with the stuff? Well, that helps you kill monsters. So you go kill monsters because you just got a new sword. But then when you kill the monsters, now you get more gold. And you can see how the loop will take you to play forever. Right. Um, so that was one blog post, right? Was that just one that you went over? Uh, yeah, that was retention. We basically covered most of the main points. Uh, the next post, do you have anything else you want to say about retention? Um, what can I say about retention? Um, you know, there's a huge amount of math involved in this. You mentioned day two retention. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, you know, my experience was that day two was more common than day one or day seven or whatever, but there is an incredible amount of math involved in all this. I mean, charts and graphs and data and stats, and it gets, pretty technical, you know? Um, so day two retention, as you mentioned, is, you know, what percentage of players come back 48 hours after the first install. And then they're tracked after that as well. Day seven retention, day 30 retention, you know, year one retention and so on. And obviously as the time scale gets larger, the number of people who return to play the game get smaller, but you can, op you know, in many cases identify these small things, which can improve this like for example if you're away for 24 hours then you send a push notification and you say um you know your soldiers are waiting for orders from you like come back to uh, tell them who to attack you know things like this which will get people back into the game and keep them kind of abreast of what's happening in the game world because the way that most free-to-play most of the really successful high grossing free-to-play games work is they're persistent online worlds which are taking place, you know, whether or not you're logged in doing something. And so they kind of want to create the constant level of urgency that things are happening without you and you need to come back and interact with them. So it's almost like like a crying baby or something, you know, that's like, come take care of me, you know? Right. Uh, so the next section is monetization. And for those unfamiliar with the term, monetization is how does the game make money off of you? And in free-to-play... Uh, games are monetized by inserting uh, inserting opportunities for you to spend money into those core loops that we just talked about. So you, you get into the game, you go through a cycle of user behaviors that you become used to and you enjoy and you feel progress going from one to the next to the next. And then there is a paywall. And the paywalls come in two types. There are soft paywalls and hard paywalls. A soft paywall is what you uh, is often called grinding. It means you don't need this paywall. You could play the game for several hours and maybe get around this paywall. Or you could just spend $5. You know, some of these soft paywalls get especially interesting once you get into more experienced players. So once you spend like a good amount of time inside a game, then these soft paywalls become all but insurmountable. You know, mm. so like in the case of Clash of Clans, for example... It's like you could um, just, you know, collect money to get this upgrade, but it'll take you like literally four months to do that. Mm. Or you can pay like five dollars to do it now. And so it, it is possible, you know, it is a soft paywall, but the reality is that the amount of time that it would require to do that makes it so that almost no one is going to do that. And if they are going to do it, they're just going to do it to say that they can do it. And of course, the other option is hard paywall. So content is gated behind, uh, you must pay. If you don't pay, you can't get there. And a lot of times this is bonus content, new levels, or it could be special gear that you can wear and show off to other players. Or like uh, Super Mario Run. Um, oh, right. Okay. Super Mario Run gave away three Yeah, the, three first, levels. the first couple stages. So this is, a, this is kind of a, a bit of an atypical free-to-play game, Super Mario Run. And it's been very controversial in its approach to monetization in particular. You yep. got really into, into uh, Super Mario Run. Why explain how that works. Yeah, I really enjoyed Super Mario Run. I almost don't even consider it a free-to-play game. Uh, they gave a sample of the game, the first three levels, and then they hard-gated they hard the rest of the game. So there were uh, 
five worlds, six worlds. Each one had four levels. You know, I, I think maybe perhaps a more accurate way to explain the monetization method of Super Mario Run is to describe it as shareware rather than free to play. You know, right. and shareware is kind of the the ancestor of free to play, right? Mm. So shareware back in the days of floppy disks was where you would the game would be on the floppy disk and it would be just a demo and you would complete the first stage or whatever it was. And then it would say, if you enjoyed the game, then you've got to pay more to get the full game. And so you'd only have kind of a glimpse of what the actual game would be about. But this has kind of died off. Like it's pretty rare that we see games that use this particular method. And Super Mario Run was one of those. Right. Um, Some of the more common methods I have listed here. Uh, one of the methods is called layering and abstraction. And basically what you do is you hide the math. Um, so let's say in this game you want to summon a big hero. And this hero requires summoning tokens. So you spend these summoning tokens. But you need to purchase these summoning tokens spe- using your green gems. And where do you get green gems? Well, maybe you can grind or maybe you can just buy them for $5. And basically, by all these levels of abstraction you don't realize that in order to get the high-level hero that you want, you have to spend $30. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of obfuscation, you know, especially with more than one or two currencies. Mm -hmm. A lot of these games have, like, blue crystals and green crystals or they have pearls and something else. I mean, it it can get really difficult to keep track of what is what and how much is worth, you know, a dollar. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and that brings us to premium currencies, which everyone's familiar with. It, it comes from casinos. Basically, people are willing to part with chips, but not dollars. So same thing in a game. Things are listed as gems and not dollars. Uh, the next I have listed is hard boost versus soft boost. Uh, so a soft boost is like a temporary boost. Maybe you get more hit points or magic points. And a hard boost would be like a new sword. And so if you think about which one is more profitable... You can only sell a new sword once, but the soft boosts you can sell forever and ever. Um, time wall is another strategy. So, the, so the, before we move on, the soft boost would be like a potion or some kind of something like that. Yeah, a like potion. a temporary boot, like a temporary buff. Right. So uh, by selling these temporary things, you you as a developer, you gain unlimited inventory. Got it. Uh, next thing is uh, time wall. Basically, you make players wait or they can pay. And I believe this is uh, was used in Clash Royale with the chests. Yeah, I think every Supercell game has this. Yeah, so either you wait to... What is it? You have a certain number of slots and then you could wait to open the chest. Right, exactly. Or you can pay and just open the chest right away. Right, 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 right. Basically, they're playing on you know gratification. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you can wait and be patient, then you'll get what's coming to you. And if you can't, then you can have it right now. Mm-hmm. And just pressing that sense of immediacy or urgency, you know, giving players, I want to play it now. You know, you can fight someone and you win the battle, but you got to wait 12 hours to fight again. It's like, well, I want it now. I'll pay a couple gems to do that. And you can fight now. Yeah, actually, you bring up another very big uh, strategy for monetization, which is uh, to make the player feel like they've gained something. But if they don't make a purchase, then they will lose it. So in uh, Clash Royale, you can keep fighting more and more matches once you've filled up all of your chest slots. And you'll get more chests. But if you don't pay to unlock the chests occupying the slots, then you will lose those chests that you just fought for. Right. So you see, this, you see this a lot in games. They'll let you make some progress. They'll show you what you've gained. And then they'll threaten you with losing it if you don't purchase which is a very powerful mechanism. Yeah, that's the, a lot of these are really effective psychological tactics. And many of these were developed by psychologists working for game developers. A lot of the biggest free-to-play game developers, like Machine Zone, which is now called MZ, which is the developer for Game of War, they employ a number of economists and psychologists, and they include all those disciplines directly into the design of all these mechanisms. And as we mentioned in our previous podcast, a lot of the ways that these mechanics work are very similar to casinos and slot machines, the way that they psychologically get their hooks inside you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Next, I've got uh, variable rewards, which we talked about last podcast by relating it to the Skinner box. Right. And this is just um, with with almost any mammal, because I think the Skinner box was originally rats. Yep. 
if you give a rat a button and they push the button and nothing comes out, they'll stop pushing the button. If you give the rat a button and they push the button and water comes out every time, then they will push it just as much as they need. But if you give the rat a button and pushing the button gives a random reward, maybe it's water, maybe it's nothing, then they'll actually consume way more water because of this feeling of scarcity and they'll push the button more. And so giving random rewards for things instead of solid uh, certain rewards gets people gets people more addicted. Yeah, this is the, the gotcha mechanism. Was in your previous employer, did they use this word a lot? Uh, yeah, that comes from Japan, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, gotcha. This, I would used to hear this word like several times a day. Um, do you know what the, what the word comes from? I just thought it was like, I got you. I got gotcha. you. No. Yeah, no, no, no. So it's based on these uh, uh, Japanese vending machines. Right. So, yeah, in Japan, they have these vending machines which have these little balls, right? And inside, they have like a little toy. It might be like a little figurine or, you know, some kind of toy, right? And these are collectible. And j- collectibles are like a big... Collectible physical things are a big thing in Japan, big culture around that. And so, the full word is gachapon. Mm. And so, you would insert your yen coins into the machine, you would turn a little thing and you would get one of these balls out and people would try to collect all of them. And the power of it was not knowing which one you'd get. And it was the random element, like the, the element of surprise. And free-to-play developers especially have gotten so into this mechanism after it is it has already taken over Japan. It already became commonplace in Japan and now it's really global. But the basic idea is exactly what you were stating, which is random rewards. Mm. Yeah, so maybe the blue guinea pig is very common, but the green dragon's not, and you want the green dragon, so you might spend three hundred dollars, right? And you get a bunch of blue guinea pigs that you don't need. Yeah, and you just get oh, it's exciting, you know, when you don't know what you're going to get, like right before you pull the lever, you know, it's like a slot machine. It's like this could be the one. It's that feeling. Uh, next on my list, I have difficulty spikes. So this is pretty closely tied to retention. When players start playing your game, they need to feel challenged, but not too challenged. If they feel too challenged, they'll feel frustrated. So you get the player involved with the game. It's easy. Uh, And then you get to a point where the player is invested and they've invested a certain amount of time, so they're not going to want to quit. And then you give them an insurmountable difficulty spike that can only be overcome with either paying or grinding. Hmm. So you see that in a lot of free-to-play games, um, th- there will just be certain levels where everyone says it's impass- impossible to beat the level. That's done on purpose. Um, competition and social pressure is huge. Uh, yeah, so that's really to, huge. We talked about building a community by actually paying for players. And the whole point of this is if you have players and they're talking to each other and maybe they're talking smack because my clan is better than your clan... I mean, you're going to be tempted to spend money just to beat these other players. So powerful, especially in groups. So you and I have a clan inside a game and there's another clan which is messing with us, which is like attacking us, stealing our gold, you know, taking our territory, whatever it is. We will band together to like get them back. I mean, that the, this group think psychology is so deeply embedded into you know, human thought. This is such a powerful psychological element to get people invested into a game. Um, And also within a clan too. So if you have like leaderboards for your clan, you know, you don't want to get left behind or a lot of these alliances or clans inside these games will have requirements like in Clash of Clans or Clash Royale, for example, you need a certain number of trophies to maintain your position inside this group. And to get trophies, you got to be active. You got to be fighting people every day, upgrading your base and so on. You don't want to fall behind. You want to be, you want to maintain your position within the social hierarchy in the game. Okay. The last strategy that I have listed under monetization is a first payer conversion. So this is another powerful technique where players who have not made a purchase are going to be the least likely to make purchases in your game. So what you do is you make the first purchase cheap, accessible, and very desirable. Maybe it offers way more than the later purchase as well. Sure. And once someone makes a purchase, uh, now they've not only invested time, but also money, and they've already done that purchase behavior once. So it's already become a habit for them. A psychological barrier breaks down once the first purchase is made. Before that time, they're thinking, oh, you know, spending money will cross me over into some other different type of player or some other different type of person. This is especially common in the West, in the United States and in Europe. 
in Japan and China less so because digital purchases of this kind are much more culturally common. But in the United States or in the West in particular, after that first purchase is made, it makes it so much more likely that a second, third, and a fourth purchases and, and potentially even more will come after that. Developers know this, so they will do anything they can to get that first purchase to happen, even if you get 10 times the value of a normal purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember I experienced this in my real life. Um, it, there was a time when games came freely and cheaply, and then Steam came around. And Steam was so easy to make the first purchase of a game. And now I have like hundreds of games. And before, just 10 years ago, I never would purchase a game. There's so many free ways to get games. Are you talking about pirating? Oh, I, well, I would never talk about pirating. Oh, never, of course. No, what am I, what am I talking about? Um, okay, so then I have a few more concepts. So they're not strategies for monetization, but they're, they're things that developers consider. Uh, the first one is cohort revenue. Yeah, we talked about cohort analysis just before we recorded this. I think you worked a lot with that um, before in your previous job, right? Um, it's a big part of the process. You know, you have to understand who is who inside the game. I mean, if you take just, it depends on the game also. But you know, in the games which I was working on, they had millions of players, and so you have to identify who is who inside the game. Who are the people who are spending money? What is their demographic background? Who are the people who are not spending money? How can we really? break this large group of daily players, DAU, daily active users, into a smaller group which, where we can understand who they are and what they want. And that is what cohort analysis is. Okay. So an important part of cohort analysis, and we mentioned earlier, is whales. Right. Uh, basically, 98% um, of a game's revenue will come from 2% of its players. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, you, another way to put that is 98% of players are not going to spend any money in the game at all. And that's actually in a really, really good game. If it's only 98%, that's not bad. But basically, all of this revenue, a huge amount of revenue, comes from a tiny, tiny fraction of the players. And they spend a lot. A fraction of those paying users spend a lot, yeah. Which makes up most of the game's revenue. Of the vast majority, yeah. I mean, if you have you know, people spending a dollar or two dollars, like that helps. you know. But the real money in most free-to-play games comes from players who spend a lot of money. Yeah, and to take it back to user acquisition, um, these companies, these game companies, are not just competing over players. The the main thing they're really competing over is the whales. They want to attract the whales to their games. Right, absolutely. Did you ever have any experience dealing with whales? You mean like customer service? Yeah, just like, you know, get to know them in any way? or No, I was always scared of them. <laughs> if they had that much money to put into a game, just imagine how powerful they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to look at it. Uh, did you? Did you deal with whales? Um, I did, actually. Yeah, I got to know... Uh, well, I mean, not like a really big whale. I mean, we had players who spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so I didn't get to know any of them personally. But I did um, get to know people who spent thousands of dollars in a game. I mean, and had multiple conversations with them. You know, they seemed like really cool people. I remember one in particular was a French guy, maybe like 35 years old or so. He had two kids. He had a wife. He, he went boating on vacation. Just seemed like a very normal guy, you know? And I was trying to connect these two seemingly incontrovertible things, you know? <laughs> guy with a wife and kids and like normal life who's also spending like thousands of dollars inside a mobile strategy game. It was just very difficult for me to put myself in his shoes and understand, you know, how that is. But the truth is that these whales, a lot of them are just normal people. I mean, they may be people you know, you know? You never know. A lot of people who seem like they wouldn't, you know, spend a lot of money inside a mobile game, maybe they are. It's more common now than it's ever been by a long shot. So that about exhausts uh, my list. I uh, I have a more extensive list, and also I go into all three categories a bit more in my blog. Um, yeah, what's the what's the address of your blog? Yeah, so if you want to go, uh, we'll link it below the podcast, I guess. But it's uh, from game to from game to brain dot blogspot dot com. Did you ever try to get from game to brain dot com the domain? No. That's a good name. I haven't crossed that paywall barrier in my mind yet. <laughs> Free blog. Cross it once. GoDaddy needs to give you a discount. That's a good uh, domain name, though. That's a good blog name. I y like it. Yeah, I might try that. Um, well, I do have one website to recommend. This is uh, one of my favorite game designers who has a blog with some really fantastic commentary on game design, and 100% of it is about uh, free-to-play. The uh, name of the website is Deconstructor of Fun. And the web address is deconstructorofun.com. 
And there are some really deep analysis on free to play games. And generally speaking, if there's a big new game which has come out, um, he will do uh, really detailed analysis on the game and its mechanics, and he'll make predictions on how he thinks it goes. Um, his name is Michael Katkoff. He used to be a designer at Supercell, and, he, and uh, later he, I think, was at King.com. He's been at a lot of the largest free to play developers globally. And that's a really great blog, which I recommend. You know, there is one final thing which I really wanted to mention on this podcast and kind of talk about with you. And that is kind of the perception within the game industry that free to play is inherently a bad thing. It's kind of the morality around free to play. And I think this is really interesting because free play really gets a bad rap. And I can really clearly see why, because there are a lot of examples of games which do, you know, really unethical, immoral things just to make money. And it gives this kind of, you know, gambling, seedy, you know, feel to games. And that's a bad thing. But there are also a lot of really great games which use the free-to-play business model to just spread, you know, really wonderful things. And in a lot of cases, many people will download and play some of the best games that you can get, especially on mobile phones. And it'll be for free. And in a lot of these games, you don't need to spend money. You know, you're not, they're not using psychological tricks to try to rope you in. And I think it's really important that people understand that not all free to play games are bad. Some of them are really great. And free to play has contributed, you know, a huge amount to the explosion and the growth of the mobile game industry. And it's made it so that now, you know, if you buy a new iPhone 7 now, you can fill it with a ton of great free to play games. Um, you probably won't find those in the top grossing chart, <laughs> by the way. So that's not the place to go look for those. Uh, but there are a lot of really great ones. Um, I've listed a list of about 90 or so of my favorite iOS games, the vast majority of which are on Android, on my personal blog, which is at justcharlie.com slash iOS dash games. And about 80% of those games are free to play. But I kind of wanted to mention this and also just see how you feel about the morality and ethical, you know, controversy surrounding free to play. Personally, I gave up on any game that says free, whether it's on my computer or my phone. Um, I've tried one or two that I did like, um, they were really well known free to play games. Clash Royale was free, really enjoyed it. Uh, I didn't go too deep into the game, but um, I do think there are some developers who walk that line between making money and delivering a good game for free uh, very well. And maybe it's just a hard line to walk. Um, yeah, it might be. I don't know. I mean, there are so many bad examples. It's kind of like, what's a good um, analogy here? Where of a large group of things, it's like a small minority do really bad practices, which give a bad name to the whole thing. Mm. But in any case, all right, yeah, avoiding free free games is one way to go too. There, there is something to be said for the approach that you know I'm looking for a good game. I'm willing to pay for it. There are a lot of developers who are selling games for a dollar or two dollars or whatever. But it really has been amazing to see this massive transformation in the mobile game industry in particular. I remember when I first started working in mobile games in 2010, the top game on the market was Angry Birds. And Angry Birds popularized the idea of a 99 cent game. And so at the time, the predominant, you know, attitude towards mobile gaming was you need to have a 99 cent game. And one of the reasons why the company which I was working at blew up to be so large was because they said, no, we're going to make it free to play. And at the time, there was not a lot of people doing that. Yep. It's very successful. <laughs> it is successful financially. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining me on this podcast. I was looking forward to talking about free to play with you. And I think I learned a little bit from some of the acronyms and concepts which you shared. Your blog has some really great resources which people can refer to if they're just interested in learning some more details or if they're working in the free to play mobile games industry. Yeah. Thanks for having me. 